Well, I'm, I'm glad you all are here with, with us again today. Um, and I, I kind of want to talk about something that, that, that I think everybody has experienced in one way, shape, or form at one time or another. I mean, some of you have, have experienced things in your life that, that you just know, that you know are physically impossible, things that can't possibly happen. I mean, things that, that you just know shouldn't happen and that there's really no ex- explanation for, no way to explain it. I mean, we've all heard or experienced a time when somebody we know or somebody we love has been diagnosed with, with a devastating disease, um, cancer, for instance. Somebody has been diagnosed with a cancer only later to find out that the mass has, has somehow disappeared with no explanation for how it happened, why it happened. Doctors are clueless, and they just don't know what's going on, where, what happened, because it was clear this person had this mass, and now it's gone. That should be impossible, right? Or we've, we've all probably heard stories, especially, I think these are especially prevalent in, in, in smaller rural communities like this, where there's a, a horrific car accident, but there happens to be a passerby coming through and, and pulling somebody from the wreckage just in the nick of time, only then to walk off and disappear and never to be seen from or heard from again. And nobody has any explanation for how this person got here or, or where this person went. Nobody can identify them, but they just happen to be there at the right time and nobody can explain it. Or some other natural phenomena. I mentioned last week, if I reached out and I dropped my Bible right now, we all know that it's going to fall to the floor. That's common sense. But I, I think about this time where, where this mysterious kind of this weird thing happened in my life. Um, and it was kind of on a big day for me, and we don't have time to get into why it was such a big deal now. But uh, I remember a friend of mine, his little brother and I, we went fishing out at my uncle's cabin. And underneath the wall of this cabin, there was a little place that had been dug out like something had been burrowing underneath. Not at all uncommon. So I don't know if it was a raccoon, what it was that had been digging there. But we're getting ready to leave. Fishing was terrible that day, by the way. Um, but we're getting ready to leave, and we, I look over, and there are these three little birds that look like sparrows that crawl out from underneath this cabin. I'm thinking, those birds should not be under that cabin. That's not a good place for them. But these birds come out, and they fly up about 10 to 12 feet away, something somewhere thereabouts, and they, they go up, and they swoop around, and I watch them come right back at me. So they come flying in my direction, and these are just little bitty birds, look like little sparrows, and they come flying down, and I just kind of step to the side and watch these birds, one right after the other, fly into the wall of the cabin and fall to the ground and crawl right back underneath. No explanation for it. It is the wildest thing. If you know what happened that day, there was actually a car accident where I hit my head, so I'm thinking maybe I was seeing birds. Um, But I know that this shouldn't have happened. Like, it shouldn't have happened. There's no explanation for why these crazy birds flew up one right after the other into the wall of this cabin and then crawled back underneath. No explanation for it. But that's kind of what we're going to look at today. Not crazy birds. Not crazy birds. Um, yeah, that, that sounds an awful lot like angry birds. But um, not, like, not like these crazy birds, but we are going to look at something that, that given natural law, given what we know is true, should not be possible. We're going to look at an instance in the Bible where this happens. So if you have a copy of God's Word with you, and I hope that you do, I would invite you to open it with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. We're diving back into the Old Testament. For those of you who don't know, we've been working through a Bible reading plan as a church together. And and we are currently in 2 Kings. We're starting to get into some of the other minor prophets. And this is one of those stories that stood out to me. It's a short story. But it's one that really kind of jumped off the page at me where we see this impossible thing happen with an iron axe head that swims. So that's what I want to look at today. So if you have a copy of God's Word with you, I would invite you to open it. 2 Kings chapter 6. If you all would stand with me wherever you are, let's read God's Word together, and then we'll dive in and see what lessons it has for us today. So 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, says... The sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Please notice that the place where we live under your supervision is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan where we can each get a log and can build ourselves a place to live there. Go, he said. Then one said, Please come with your servants. I'll come, he answered. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Oh, my master, it was borrowed. 
Then the man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, the man of God cut a piece of wood, threw it there, and made the iron float. Then he said, pick it up. So he reached out and took it. Thank God for his word, and you may be seated. I told you, this is a short story. This is a short little narrative in the middle of this bigger picture. So we have this guy named Elisha that the most of 2 Kings follows. We follow the prophetic ministry of Elisha. And Elisha came onto the scene right after this other guy named Elijah. So people always get those two confused. Don't worry, you're not alone. First Kings follows Elijah. Then we hit Second Kings and is following the prophetic ministry of Elisha. And Elisha was a student of Elijah. And we have these two going along, and there's this big scene at the end, uh, or at the beginning of 2 Kings, where there's this whirlwind and this fiery chariot, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Elijah swept in, and Elisha says, okay, now what? And he's asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and he doesn't know if he's going to get it or not until he picks up Elijah's, Elijah's garment, his cloak, and he strikes the water with it, the water parts, and he can walk through on dry ground again. So he says, oh, God has given me what I've requested. And it's this awesome scene. And then from there, Elisha goes on and does these other amazing miracles by God's power. And he's this prophetic minister of God to the world. And that's what 2 Kings largely follows. It's the ministry of this guy named Elisha. But see, there, there are lessons that we need to learn along the way as we go along through this. And what lessons is it that we need to learn? What lessons do we need to be cautious of, especially in a short narrative, seven verses, where there's this crazy scene where this axe head floats, swims. We'll get to that later. Don't worry. I know you all thought I was crazy whenever I said that. Don't worry. We'll get there. But there are lessons that we need to learn along the way, lessons that we need to pick up on and carry out. So today I want to show you some lessons that we need to learn in order to effectively carry out our God-given mission. Because God has given us a mission, hasn't he? I mean, if you are a follower of Jesus, then you should know God has given you a mission. He has commissioned you to carry out a task that only you can do. So how do we do these things? How do we carry it out? What are the things that we must learn to effectively carry out our God-given mission? Well, first, if we're going to effectively carry out our God-given mission, we must learn that discipleship is a necessity, not an option. Discipleship is a necessity, not an option. Okay, this, this story, this, this short little seven verses starts out, starts out with the sons of the prophets. The sons of the prophets, right? Verse one reads, the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, please notice that the place where we live under your supervision is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan where we can each get a log and can build ourselves a place to live there. So essentially what we have here is one of the earliest seminaries on record. Okay, just to help you understand what's going on. This is like an early seminary where we have these sons of the prophets. These, this is a group of young men who have started following Elisha and the teachings of Elisha. Just like Elisha had learned from Elijah, these men have now stepped up underneath the tutelage of Elisha. So they're following him. And virtually every reference to these sons of the prophets are in Elisha's story. They're following Elisha. They are following his teachings. They're learning from him. They're being, being guided along by him. And these guys have devoted themselves to Elisha and his teaching. In a sense, in a sense, these guys are kind of like the, the 12 disciples. That's kind of what these guys are like before Jesus was ever born in Bethlehem. These guys are following the prophet of God. They're living with him. They're talking with him. They're clinging to him. And now, because Elisha has done these amazing things, right? He made a river part. So now these guys have heard this story, and they are following Elisha. And there's so many of them who are hearing these and flocking to Elisha that their housing complex is too small. They have to find some other way to live. So they decide that they need to expand. But there's this, this neat thing that they do. Instead of just heading down to the river and, be, and start just beginning the construction, they go to their leader. They go to Elisha and ask his approval. Look, uh, you, you guys are probably like me sometimes. Sometimes I do things that are a little bit rash. Sometimes I do things without thinking them through all the way. Um, I, I know that is a struggle of mine. And a lot of times when I do it, I get myself into trouble. Because, hey, there's an opportunity to do something. I'm going to go do it. Let's just do it. 
And I know that there are times that I have thought, hey, I probably should have asked for some advice. I probably should have asked somebody who is older than me, who's experienced more than me, hey, is this a good idea? Is this something that we ought to do? Is this something I should try to do? Because there's something to be said for good, godly counsel. And it's all over the Proverbs. I mean, you want to read a book about wisdom, go read the Proverbs and it tells you how to be wise. And it's all over. I mean, Proverbs 11, 14, 12, 15, 15, 22, and on and on and on. Wisdom in seeking counsel. Seek counsel. It is a good idea. And these guys realize that. So they turn to Elisha and say, hey, our housing unit's too small. Can we go down to the river and build a new one? Can we do that? And Elisha gives them his blessing. And he says, tells them to go. But for at least one of them, and we don't know which one, but at least one of them says, well, just your your approval isn't enough. We want you to go with us. Like, we want you to come with us down to the Jordan River where we're going to build this. We want you to be there with us. So he agrees to go with them. But why is this such a big deal to him? I mean, why does it really matter? They're going to go build a housing unit. They don't need a prophet to stand there preaching over them while they're doing it, do they? I don't know about you all. I mean, sometimes I like to listen to things while I'm working, but, but I don't need somebody standing over my shoulder saying, hey, you need to do this differently. That's not, I don't think that's what they wanted. Why is this such a big deal to them? Well, it's because they knew the importance of discipleship. They knew how imperative it was. They knew how crucial it was to have somebody building them up. Okay, so if that's true, what is discipleship? What is this discipleship? I mean, we use the word disciple all the time in, in church, right? You come to a church service and everybody's talking about discipleship or being a disciple of Jesus, being a follower of Jesus. What does that really mean? Well, discipleship would refer to, to the act of being a student. A disciple is literally, it literally translated as it's a student or a pupil. So it's somebody who is sitting underneath the teaching of somebody else. So discipleship would be the act of being taught. It would be the act of being a student. And really, nowhere in the Old Testament is the word disciple used, with the exception of one line in Isaiah, but these guys still knew the value of discipleship. They knew the value of being a student underneath the teachings of Elisha. They have devoted themselves to it, and they didn't want to be separated from it. They know how important it is. And I find it, I find it interesting that that command is the one that Jesus chooses to give his followers, his followers, as he commissions them to go and do the work. I know I quoted it last week, and it's one of my favorites, though, Matthew 28, where Jesus tells his disciples to go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. First act in Christianity isn't to build a bigger building, it's to go and make disciples. That's the point. Go and make students. Go and make pupils. Go make these people who will sit under sound teaching and grow. Jesus commands us to go and make disciples, followers of his. And see, I think maybe too often we pretend, we pretend that we are, we are somehow fulfilling this commission by, by showing up once a week to a church service and we say, well, yeah, I'm being taught up because I heard a sermon this week. And we're like, well, hey, I'm growing because I am. Listen, that's a fantastic start. That is a fantastic, at least I hope it's a fantastic start. That's good. That is a good place to go, and we certainly need that. But that's not the picture we get here in 2 Kings. That's not the picture we get with these sons of the prophets. And it's certainly not the picture we get as we watch Jesus, and he calls the 12, and he lives with the 12. He, they are always together. They, they are constantly. They live together. They eat together. They work together. They travel together. They heal together. They, they prophesy together. These guys are always together, revolving around Jesus, wanting to learn more from him. And that is the picture we get of discipleship, not only from Jesus, but also here in 2 Kings with Elisha. And some of us know what it's like to to experience this. True discipleship where we are together, not just Sunday mornings, but we're together throughout the week and we're mutually edifying, we're encouraging one another, we're building one another up, at times rebuking one another. Some of you have experienced that. Some of you may not have experienced that. But let me just tell you, this is why I think there is such a great value in in small groups, in Sunday school classes, in Bible studies throughout the week, or throughout other close personal interactions with followers of Jesus. This is why it's so crucial. We need those people in our lives. 
look, you may be able to grow some, in some ways without personal interaction. You may be able to grow some. That's true. But let me just tell you, you need, not just maybe you want it. No, no, you need it. You need someone or some people in your life who can speak into your life. You need that. I know I certainly need that. Right? And, there's, and there's two sides to this. There's two sides to this. Not only is there this side where, where people, we need people in our lives to build us up, that can challenge us, that can, that can challenge us even when we're making mistakes. I mean, we certainly need those people. As a matter of fact, I think about people like that in my life, and, and I'll just give you one example, and I can use this because I don't think you'll be too upset, but I think about my dad. My dad is one of those men who I know has taught me he has helped me to grow, and not just because it's a father-son relationship. I mean, it was always that way, and I've always had a great deal of respect for my dad. But I think about this, even as, we've got, as I've gotten older, I said we've gotten older. He's an old man now. Um, there, I'll take my shot since I'm building them up. But look, I mean, my dad and I, we, our relationship has changed, and I felt it. I remember the moment it, it really hit me that our relationship had changed some from this, from this teacher-pupil kind of relationship to this, we are now peers, and we need to build one another up. Um, we were sitting there actually praying together. We were praying together, and I remember he, he was praying for me, not only as his son, not only as his pastor, but as his friend. And at that moment, like the light kicked on for me and said, look, this is what discipleship is. It's, it's people walking through life together, building one another up, encouraging one another. And that's when it came alive to me. And I realized that that was what discipleship was. So please, my point isn't just to brag on how great my dad is. My dad is awesome. But my point is to say that we need those mutually edifying relationships in our lives. You need those people who have the authority to speak into your life and that you can question, that you can ask, that you can go to for advice. You need those people in your life if you are going to be a good disciple of Christ, if you are going to effectively carry out your God-given mission. But then there's the other side of this, isn't there? So there's the side where you're the student and the, the one is like the, the teacher or, or, the, or the master and you're following after them. But then there's the other side that I think a lot of times we overlook is we're saying, how am I being discipled? And the other side is, is raising up that next generation. Is who am I discipling? I mean, in some instances, you will be the student and the other will be the teacher and you will be building off of that. But in other times, we need to be a teacher or a discipler. We need to be making disciples. There is that side, specifically with the next generation. As this next generation of people come up, we need to be building them up and encouraging them and training them what it means to be a good follower of Christ. We need to be doing that. And if we aren't intentionally raising up young leaders in our church, then we're not carrying out the great commission given by Jesus. If we're not discipling others, we are not carrying out the, the commission that Jesus gave us in Matthew 28. Look, I've heard several people, and I don't want to pick on any one person because I've heard this from at least a handful of people, but I've heard people say that it almost feels arrogant to say, well, I need to disciple that person. And I understand that. It does. It feels awkward at first because it's almost like you're saying, well, I'm here and they're down here and I need to build them up. And I've heard people say, well, I think that's arrogant. And I understand that. I get it. But it's not as if by saying, well, that person is, is less mature than I am, that I need to help them. I need to encourage them. I need to help them grow. I don't think that's inappropriate any more than it is for me to look at my children and say, well, they are immature and they need to be raised to maturity. We need to look and we need to see new believers around us and say, hey, look, I, I, want, I want to work with you. I want to talk with you. I want to maybe encourage you. I want to teach you. And that doesn't mean that you don't learn anything from them. I've learned a lot from having three kids. I have learned a whole lot from having three kids. You, but still, we need to realize that we need to be raising up that next generation in the church just like we do in our family dynamics. I mean, I'm raising up three kids hoping that someday they are mature and then they'll have kids and they can raise their children to maturity and they can raise their kids to maturity and on and on and on. But in the church, a lot of times we miss this where we think, well, I need to be built up and not look at how we need to be building up the next generation and bringing them to maturity in Christ. There are both sides to that coin and we need to make an effort to bring up both sides, which is actually why Steph and I, we started talking about our young adult Bible study Again, this week, we were planning on starting this about a month ago, and we had to delay the start because of COVID-19, and we can't be gathered together in our home like we wanted to be. Um, 
we actually made the decision, we're gonna to try to start this thing on Zoom and start a Zoom meeting and, and, and talk to one another and try to build one another up because, well, I know I was convicted as I read this and saying, how am I helping to build up my peers, those people around me? How am I helping to edify them? How am I being built up? Because I need a small group like that. So we've decided that we're gonna to try to start that this week. I haven't contacted anybody about it yet, but we're going to try to start that this week and actually dive in together and see what God's word has for us. But we need to be prepared to do that. We need to be prepared to do what it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, where, he, where it says, We proclaim him warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. We need to be prepared to do that, proclaiming Jesus, warning one another, encouraging one another so that we will all be mature in Christ. We want to see people raised to maturity. Listen, church, if we're going to ever effectively carry out our God-given mission, then we need to learn that discipleship is not, not optional. It is a necessity. It is a necessity. Second, if we're going to effectively carry out our God-given mission, we must learn that everything we have is borrowed. Everything we have is borrowed. So we see these young men um, we see these young men valuing discipleship, going to build their home, going to build this new housing complex in verses four through five. So Elisha decides he's gonna go with them. And when they come to the Jordan, they start cutting down trees. And as one of them is cutting down a tree, the iron ax head falls into the water and he cries out, oh, my master, it was borrowed. So like most seminarians, these guys were broke. These guys didn't have a lot to go on. These guys didn't have a job, they didn't have money, they were broke. And trust me, I've lived on a seminary campus and, and that's the topic. Like, boy, I wish we could go out tonight, but we don't have any money, so you know what? We're gonna just hang out. So like most seminarians, these guys were broke. They didn't have the money, they couldn't pool the money to go start this massive building project. They didn't have the resources for that. Um, so they decide they're gonna build it themselves because one thing they do have is strong backs. These are younger men, they're gonna go build this thing. They're just going to go and do it. So they would have all had to go borrow tools, right? Again, these are broke seminarians, which means they didn't have the money to go out and buy new tools or, or have the resources to have an ax head made out of iron. They couldn't have done it. So they had to go to their friends, to their family, to other local people and, and ask them for help to loan them the tools to do this. And as luck would have it, one of these young men loses the ax head that he had borrowed and his first reaction is to cry out because it's borrowed. Look, some of us may not understand this because uh, some people don't have respect for other people's property. Um, that's just the reality. Some people don't. Um, so a lot of people may have not have given this a lot of thought, but in this culture that we're talking about, here in this Jewish culture, this was a big deal. Borrowing something was not a small thing, and you took care of other people's property. I mean, think about Exodus chapter 22, verse 14, where it says, when a, when a man borrows an animal from his neighbor and it is injured or dies while its owner is not there with it, the man must make full restitution. You had to pay for what you lost when it happened. Proverbs 22, seven says, the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. Psalm 37, 21, the wicked person borrows and does not repay, but the righteous one is gracious and giving. The wicked borrows and doesn't repay. Borrows and doesn't repay. And these young men were men who believed that they had been called by God to do the work of God. And the last thing that they wanted was to be seen as wicked or lazy or irresponsible. They didn't want it. But what you and I, what we need to realize is that everything we have, absolutely everything we have is borrowed. Everything is borrowed. Nothing really belongs to you, does it? Nothing really does. I mean, some people are saying, well, I mean, I've got my possessions. My possessions are mine, right? Uh, well, how did you get your possessions? And everybody would say, yeah, those people who are arguing, they'd say, well, I earned them. I worked hard for those things. And maybe you did. Maybe you worked hard for those things. Maybe that's true, and you earned what you have. Maybe that's true. But let me ask you this. Where did your abilities to earn that come from? Where did that come from? Well, of course, they are a gift from God. They were given to you. 
I think about my kids. So think about your kids. Think about your children. Everybody says, well, children are a gift from God. These are my kids. Everybody says, well, hey, these are my kids. I say that all the time. I love my kids. But the truth is, children are a gift from God, and ultimately, they don't belong to me. They don't belong to me. They are human beings created in the image of God for the glory of God. Parents, your children are on loan to you. The only question is, will you be a faithful servant or a faithful steward of your children? That's the question. Will you be faithful with them? Hopefully this drives the point home. Jesus tells this parable in Matthew 25 called the parable of the talents. And in this parable, Jesus basically tells his disciples that they need to be responsible for the things that God has given them, right? So he goes to his servants and says, hey, I'm going to go away for a while. Here's some money. Here's some of these talents. I want you to, to use them wisely. The first servant comes back after the master returns and says, here's what I earned for you. And he had made it increase. Second one, made the talents increase. The third one, who was only given one talent, had gone and buried it in the ground, had nothing to show for it. And the master says, why didn't you at least put it in the bank where I could have earned some interest? You're a wicked servant because you weren't a good steward of what I've given you. And the point is, we need to be faithful stewards of what God has given us. Jesus goes on to say that those who are faithful with a few things, God's going to give them more. Those who are not faithful with those few things, he's going to take it away from them and give it to somebody else. Will we be faithful with the things that God has given us? Will we be good stewards of them? Because the reality is everything we have is borrowed. Everything. Time is borrowed. You're not guaranteed another breath. Your time is borrowed. Your money is borrowed. It ultimately doesn't belong to you. It's a gift from God. Your talents are gifts from God that eventually will not be there. Your family is a gift from God for which you will not be around for forever. Your friendships are a gift from God. Your hobbies are a gift from God that are on loan to you. And someday you will have to give an account for how you stewarded those, how it is that you took care of those. Will you be a good steward? Because Everything we have is borrowed. And if we're going to effectively carry out our God-given mission, we have to realize that everything we have is borrowed. Third, if, if we're going to effectively carry out our God-given mission, we have to learn that we need to check our heads. Now, this one was a fun one. I really wanted to put in here, we need to check our heads. It's just, it just sounds fun. I got brothers, and I remember telling them, hey, you need to check your head because you're not right right now. So I, I love this one. But so, so let me explain because I know it sounds kind of odd. These men, they've now, been, they've now been given permission by Elisha to go and build their campus housing for the Elijah Memorial Seminary with their borrowed tools, okay? So they're going down to build this housing complex, and one of these men, they lose the iron axe head that he's been working with. Loses it. Gone. Goes, falls into the river. And remember, these aren't the same kind of tools that we would work with today. Right? If I went down here to Mount City Lumber and I bought an axe, it's going to be pretty well secured. I'm, not probably, I'm probably not going to have to worry about the axe head coming off. Probably not going to have to worry about that. Now, if you've worked with some of the tools that I've worked with, you know that this is still an issue. Sometimes things don't stay together. But in this time, these are all handcrafted. Right? These are all handmade. They probably wouldn't have been the nice machine tools that we think of now. These are handcrafted tools. And apparently, this wasn't terribly uncommon for an axe head to come off while somebody was using it. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 4 through 5, there's this provision made for a person who accidentally kills his neighbor. Accidentally kills his neighbor. And the example that's given for how this happens is an iron axe head flying off and hitting his neighbor and killing him. So apparently this isn't terribly uncommon. So let's give this young man a little bit of credit. First of all, it could have happened to anybody. Anybody could have lost that iron axe head. It could have happened to any of them. But it happened to him. And whenever it did happen, he didn't try to hide it. He didn't just keep on swinging the axe handle as if everything was fine. Instead, he stopped and called out for help. And everyone who's listening right now was thinking, well, duh, of course he didn't just keep on swinging the axe handle. Of course he stopped and called out for help. But the truth is, I think we do that. I think we do that all the time. I think there are times we lose our cutting edge and we just keep on swinging away. I think that happens a lot. 
far more often than I want to admit. I'll just tell you, uh, I tend to think that I'm a reasonably capable person. I don't think that's arrogant to say. There's a lot of things that I'm able to do. I'm not great at a lot of things, but I can, I can get by with most things. My wife gets frustrated because a lot of times there'll be a home improvement project and, and I'll say, no, I think I, I think I can handle that. It may not be done the best, but I can, I can do it. So I tend to think I'm a pretty capable person. And I, I tend to think that there are a lot of things I can do without fully relying on Christ. Now, don't hear me say that there's anything I can do without Christ because I do realize that unless the Spirit sustains me, I'm not going to take my next breath. I know that. There's nothing I can do apart from, apart from God in the world. There is nothing that I can do. But I tend to think that I'm a pretty capable person. So let me just say, I know for a fact there is some real damage that I can do with just the handle of a tool. I know that I can do some damage with the handle of a tool. Um, my family actually has this, this story that we have affectionately termed the, the hoe handle incident. Um, yeah, and it's, it's a fun story. So my, my brother and I, we were probably about, probably about 10 and 5, my younger brother and I. I was probably about 10 years old. He was about 5, and my parents had to run out for a while. So I, I remember they, they told us, well, um, we're just going to be gone for a little bit. Just stay in the house. It'll be fine. We'll be home after a while. And I think, okay, fine. So we're hanging out here at the house, and of course, because we were told not to go outside, what was the one thing we had to do? We had to go outside. So we go outside, and we're being a 10-year-old and a 5-year-old. And we're out here playing in the front yard, and we have this hoe handle. The blade was long gone. Nobody knows where it was. But we had this hoe handle, and my younger brother and I, we decided we're going to play karate out in the front yard. So I'm the master, and I'm teaching my little brother these moves, and I'll swing the hoe handle, and I'll say, okay, now whenever I tell you to duck, you have to duck. So I swing it, and he ducks, and we're playing. I say, okay, now I'm going to swing it at your feet. You need to jump whenever I tell you to jump. So I swing it, and he jumps over it. What I didn't take into account was that my cousin had left a skateboard at the house, and my little brother was distracted by the skateboard. So I swing the hoe handle with everything I've got, and I say, duck, but he doesn't duck. And I connect with my little brother's forehead. And let me just tell you, there is damage that I can do with a, just the handle of a tool. Long story short, my brother's, well, he's reasonably okay. Um, I'm convinced that was where everything went wrong for him. But um, the point is, there's a lot that a person can do without the cutting edge. There's a lot a person can do without a cutting edge, with just, with just on your own. But if I had gone to a tree with an axe handle. Even now, as a grown man, I could go to a tree with nothing more than an axe handle and I could pound on that tree until I couldn't pick my arms up and that tree is gonna be just like it was before. Now, I know there's always gonna be a sarcastic person who says, well, what if it was a little tree? Or you could damage the bark and an insect could kill the tree. Yeah, I know all of that, but let's just be honest. I'm not gonna be able to knock that tree down. I'm not. I could swing that axe handle all day and that tree is going to be fine. But see, that's what we're doing when we're trying to go forward on our own strength, not on the strength that God gives us. We're just swinging an empty handle without a cutting edge. We need to rely on Christ to do the real work. Look, this reality hit me. It's hit me in the past. It's hit me in years past. Um, but it hit me again this week as I sat right here in this room thinking about what I was going to preach. It was actually Friday, Friday afternoon. I was sitting right here in this room. I was listening to a 1984 sermon by a man named Jack Taylor on this passage. And he started talking about losing your cutting edge. And it just hit me like there are so many times where I, I, I am guilty of this. I know I'm guilty of this. And I know other people are guilty of this, where we, we try to proclaim Christ and we were like, hey, you need to come to salvation and we do everything we can on our own power, on our own ability, and we just keep on swinging that axe handle and trying to knock those trees down and bring people to Christ. And the reality is you're not able to knock that tree down. What you need is the cutting edge who is Christ. You need the Spirit to go and do the work for you. I had to realize there is nothing I can say or do that is going to persuade you well enough that you come to salvation. Nothing. I could, be as, I could show as much charisma as possible. I could speak as, as, as articulate as possible, but it does nothing if Christ isn't doing the work. Nothing if God doesn't do the work. And basically, like this young seminarian, Jack Taylor said that we need to let the ax head do the work for us. That doesn't mean that we don't have a responsibility. That's not what that means at all. As a matter of fact, the axe handle does clearly have a job, doesn't it? It delivers the head. 
And the head does the cutting. The head does the work. And you and I aren't meant to save anybody, but we are meant to deliver the one thing that does the saving. That's our task. But that only happens if we make sure that we haven't lost our cutting edge. Ecclesiastes 10.10 says, If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen its edge, then one must exert more strength. However, the advantage of wisdom is that it brings success. Make sure your cutting edge is where it needs to be. Make sure it's sharp. Make sure you're connected to the one who really does the work. Okay? So, discipleship is a necessity, not an option. Everything we have is borrowed, and we need to check our heads. Make sure we are connected to the head. And then number four, to effectively carry out our God-given mission, we must learn that God can recover that which was lost. God can recover that which was lost. Remember what this man does. As soon as he loses the axe head, what does he do? He cries out. He cries out. And in comes Elisha, who asks where it fell in verse 6. And then Elisha cuts a piece of wood. He throws it in the river, and the axe head floats. Right? This, this miracle happens where this iron axe head, and I actually thought about getting an axe with a bucket of water and dropping an axe into it, saying, what's going to happen here? We all know that axe is going to sink. I didn't need a visual illustration for this. You know iron sinks when it's dropped in water. We know that. But that's what happened. Literally, the text says that the iron axe head swims. The word that most of our Bibles have translated as floats literally means it swims. This iron axe head comes to the surface, swimming to the top. I don't know if it sprouted arms or what, but this thing comes to the top of the water. It swims. When we lose our connection to God, to our cutting edge, when we fall away, when we lose that thrill that comes with following Jesus, our first reaction should always, always, always be to cry out to God to restore it. Not to turn to the newest book, not to turn to a new podcast, not to turn to a new church or a new preacher. That's not going to do it. If you have lost your cutting edge, it is because, all you need to do is cry out to God. All you need to do is cry out to God. Cry out to God. Those other things might be fine. At times they might be a necessity, but God is the one who can recover that which was lost. But how many times have we felt lost or lonely or confused or, or generally the way I would explain it is just kind of in a funk where you just don't feel right. You don't feel good. You just don't have that excitement, that enthusiasm. How many times have we done that and either been too proud to turn back to God or been too lazy to turn to the Lord or you just say, I don't know that I wanted to. I don't have that desire to. We need to do it. We need to cry out to God and he will restore it. We cry out to him and he's faithful to raise that which was lost back to the surface. But see, then there's this interesting thing that happens in verse seven. It says, then he said, pick it up so he reached out and took it. Look, I know I've said this before, and I guarantee I'll say it again. God does all the work, but that does not negate our responsibility. God does all the work. He has done the impossible, but that does not negate our responsibility. Think about this. The God of creation... The God of creation who spoke all things into being, couldn't he have just had a thought and made that iron axe head that is now on the bottom of the river, couldn't he have just had a thought and made that iron axe head materialize back on the end of the axe handle? I mean, couldn't he have done that? I mean, he created everything in existence. Of course he could have. Of course he could have done it. But that isn't what happens. This iron axe head is made to float, to swim, and he tells the young man, reach out and pick it up. He says, you have a responsibility. Listen, whenever we cry out to God because we've lost our cutting edge, because we feel lost or lonely or we feel like we're in that funk, whenever we cry out to God, God will do the impossible. God can do the impossible. But that doesn't mean that we have no responsibility. We still need to reach out and take a hold of it and cling to it. Bring it in. Draw it near. We still have a responsibility. Look, if we're going to effectively carry out our God-given mission, that we must learn that discipleship is a necessity, not an option. Everything we have is borrowed. We need to check our heads and that God can recover that which was lost. Well, so what? Okay, well, several questions I want to ask you, several ways that you can apply this. First of all, how are you being discipled? 
How are you being taught? How are you being built up? How are you being challenged? And if you're not being discipled, well, then you need to be. I mean, get involved with a small group. Get involved in a Bible study. Find someone to start meeting with uh, at least a, on at least a semi-regular basis. Find somebody to meet with, somebody that might be able to challenge you, somebody that you think might encourage you. Start with those people within your church. Find those people around you that you want to meet with on a regular basis. A small group, a Bible study. I know it's difficult right now because of this time of physical isolation, but Zoom is an amazing thing. Facebook can be a good tool. FaceTime is incredible. I mean, use the resources we have. Find a way that you can look somebody in the eye, that you can come to them and say, hey, I need advice. Hey, here's what's going on in my life. What's going on with you? I actually sat in on, um, on a meeting Friday with the elders of this church. I sat in on a meeting with them and we discussed what's going on in our lives and it was just a group of six brothers building one another up. A time where we could talk with one another, where we could, where we could share with one another. We could tell one another what's going on in our lives, concerns that we have. Sure, we talked about church business, but we spent an hour on this Zoom meeting. We talked about church business for maybe 15 minutes. We spent time just being the church, building one another up. Find those people around you. If you're apart from those kinds of discipleship, it brings you to a place where you are in danger. We need those people around us that can keep us accountable. So first of all, how are you being discipled? Second question is, who are you discipling? Who are you teaching? Who are you building up? Look, if you're not bringing up young leaders in your church, then the church is doomed to fail. You need to be bringing young leaders, young people up. You need to be encouraging them, helping them realize maturity. And again, that doesn't mean that you don't learn anything, but we need to begin to make these young people into disciples, to challenge them, to build them up, to make them closer and more faithful followers of Jesus. We need to be teaching them everything that Jesus commanded us. So who are you discipling? Look, I'm gonna ask you to do something that's a little bit funny. Most of you are sitting in your homes and you may or may not have a pen and paper with you, but I'm gonna ask you to do something. I want you to write down the name of somebody who is discipling you or you would like to ask to, to meet with you. I wanna challenge you to do that. Somebody that is either discipling you or that you would like to ask to begin that kind of a relationship with. And two, I want you to write down the name of somebody that you would like to disciple. Somebody that you would like to encourage. Somebody that you would like to try to build that relationship with because not because you are arrogant somehow and think that you're better than them, but you realize that they are a new believer and they need to be brought to maturity. Look, I find it interesting that when Jesus talks about, talks about uh, removing the plank from your own eye before he, you remove the speck from your brother's eye, he never tells us not to remove the speck from our brother's eye. Never does he say that. He just says, you need to look at yourself first. Make sure that you are in good standing with God. Make sure that you are in a right relationship with him. Make sure that you're not overlooking the plank that you have. But he never says, don't go and help your brother. Don't go help your sister. Never does he say that. <laughs> we need to be asking ourselves, how are we being discipled and who can we disciple? So third, please, and I'm, I'm asking you, and this goes right along with that, but please take a spiritual inventory. Take a spiritual inventory. Make sure that you are connected to God, that you have your cutting edge, that you are in a right place with him. And if not, if not, not only are you going to be living a life that is void of any real power, but you are not being faithful, a faithful steward of the things that God has entrusted to you. Make sure you are connected to your cutting edge. And if you realize that you've lost that, and you feel like you're in that funk, or you feel like you're distant, or you just feel like something's off, I would encourage you to do what this young man did and think back to the last place that you had to think about where you lost it and cry out for help. Think back to where you lost it and call out for help. Which leads me to my final, my final point here. And that is that God can always recover that which is lost. Always. He can always recover that which is lost. Listen, the Jordan River is, is kind of known as a dirty river. It's muddy. It's kind of mucky. It's it's. I don't know, I've, I remember I heard one preacher say it was a dirty, smelly river. I don't know, I've never smelled it, so I can't say. But what I do know is, from the pictures I've seen, it looks like it's a, a, a murky water. And there's places where water moves pretty quick, and you can't see it, and there's the muck on the bottom. So this iron axe that not only sinks through the water, but then it's down here in this mud. You know how hard that would be to find? It'd be next to impossible, and moving water, climbing in, and finding an iron axe that is now on the bottom of this river. Probably not going to happen. 
But the reality is that God, God can always recover that which is lost, even when it's impossible for you and me. So if you've lost your hope, God can recover it. The only question is, will you reach out and take it? If you've lost the joy of life, God can recover it. Will you reach out and take it? Or maybe you're wrestling with something else this morning. Maybe you're struggling because you know that you've never really submitted to God and turned to Him in salvation. Maybe you realize you've never had that connection to the cutting edge. You've maybe played church all your life or, or maybe you've been distant from God. I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're thinking, you know what? I've done things that I can't possibly turn to God with. I've done things that God can't possibly bring me back from. You don't know my story, Jared. You don't know what I've been through. Well, maybe that's true, but it doesn't matter. I promise you, no matter how impossible it seems, God can always, always, always recover that which was lost. Always. There is nothing that is too far. We talked last week about how God brings the dead back to life. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that is impossible for God. Nothing. He can always recover that which is lost. He can bring you out of the muck, out of the mud, out of the mess that you're in. So step one is cry out to him, trusting that he can make the impossible happen. And step two, reach out and cling to it. Cling to it. Cling to Jesus. Cling to the life he offers you in Jesus. Cling to it. And I hope that you'll make that decision today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. God, for the short narrative that you've given us so many years ago. God, I I thank you for it. God, it's a good challenge, I know, for me to to remember that I'm pretty much useless on my own. No matter how talented I can be, no matter how much damage I can do with with an empty utensil, God, it ultimately amounts to nothing. God, I pray that you would bring us back to a place where we're connected to the one who can do real damage, the one who can do the work. God, I pray that in everything, in, as, we're, as we're working, as we want to see your mission carried out, as we want to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching them to obey all that you've commanded us, God, as we want to do that, I pray that we would, we would stay connected to the one that has the power to really make that happen. God, that we would stay connected to you, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and that you would empower us to go and do that very thing that you've commanded us to do. God, please, please, God, help us. The lives that we have are barred and they're they're nothing unless we cling to you. God, we want to be faithful stewards. I know I want to be a faithful steward of the time, of the energy, of the talents, of the children, of the family, of the hobbies, of all those things that you've given me. God, I want to be a faithful steward of those. So God, I pray that you would empower me to do that. God, and I pray that for our church, that you would empower us to be faithful stewards of that which you've committed to us. God, so help us to do that. Give us strength to do that. God, and for those people who are are tuning in now, those people who are listening right now, anybody who can hear my voice right now, God, I pray that they would realize if they're in that funk that you can recover that which was lost. God, that you would give them the strength it takes to cry out to you and say, God, help. Lord, help me. God, I pray that we would turn to you in our times of need when we've lost our cutting edge. God, I pray that we would be a church that values discipleship, that values the building up of the saints, that values the building up of the body. God, I pray that we would value it so much that we would be intentional about it, that we would reach out to those around us, and that we would ask people to pour into our lives as we ask others if we can draw that near to them, that we can build those relationships where we have the right to speak truth into people's lives. God, I pray that you would help us to be longing for those, those kinds of relationships. God, and I, maybe most importantly, I want to pray for those who have never had, never had that kind of connection to you. Those people who have never known the truth that you can bring the dead to life. God, I pray that if there is anybody, anybody right now who can hear my voice that that has never known you, that has never cried out to you, God, I have lost it all. God, I am unworthy and I am sinful, but I know that you can make the impossible happen. God, if there's anybody like that right now, I pray that you would soften their heart and let them cry out to you. Lord, and I pray that you would let us be faithful to help them, to encourage them, to build them up as your church. God, I thank you so much for the gift that you've given us in Jesus. And I pray, I pray that you would make us faithful ambassadors of that message of reconciliation that you've entrusted to us. God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.